And uh, several members of our team went out to a very small town, and they thought that they would uh, attend church on Sunday morning, and they, which was a good idea, except neither of them spoke any German at all. And they walked in, and uh, the church was quite full. They looked around for a place to sit, and they uh, spotted a pew, empty pew in the very first row. And went up and sat there, and again, not speaking any of the language, weren't quite sure what to do, except they just followed the audience. Whenever the audience stood, they stood, and then, particularly the people immediately behind them. So uh, at the end of the service, the, the person right behind them stood up, and they stood up as well. And, uh, and the entire audience, the entire congregation broke out laughing. And they turned around, everyone was still seated, they were very embarrassed, uh, they sat down. And so the way out of the, the church, the minister greeted them, greeted them on the steps in perfect English and said, uh, you must be Americans. And they said, yes, yes, we are. How did you know? So well, when you stood at the end of the service, I'd ask for the father of the new baby in the congregation to stand, to stand up. So, <laughs> so my, my first uh, cultural experience here. So anyways, uh, John talked a lot about our model. I'm going to give you a quick survey of things that we're doing, things we're seeing in Boston, particularly related to transformation. As John said, uh, together we're one of the largest, we are the largest academic research enterprise in the U.S., uh, over 1.5 billion in research. Our faculty are all appointed at Harvard Medical School. Uh, uh, Mass General, one of the oldest hospitals in the U.S., established in 1811. And that's some data on the two major uh, hospitals. We are a system with those two at the center. We have other hospitals as well. So kind of what's our view, uh, at least from my corner of partners, about transformation? It is happening, you know, in the U.S. it's been talked about going back at least 30 full years. Uh, and it is uh, forcing uh, a rethinking of how care is delivered and kind of some of the basic fundamentals. So you think about uh, our hospitals, as John said, Mass General number one in the U.S. You get to be number one by being great at quaternary care, delivering, taking care of the sickest people uh, in the population. But now the business is changing and the ability to manage large populations of people uh, largely through primary care and use of electronic uh, systems uh, is a, uh, an increasing discriminator in, uh, in how hospitals operate. Obviously there's a massive consolidation taking place and I just, you know, Bayer and Monsanto, everyone's familiar with that one that's in play. And the device side, Apple and St. Jude, uh, uh, moving uh, towards conclusion, Zimmer and Biomet before that. On the payer side, you know, in the U.S., uh, for a typical academic medical center, slightly more than half, but for us it's 52 percent of the bills are paid by the federal government. Uh, the balance is private payers, and, and the relationship with them just uh, basically de uh, defines your economic viability since the federal government does not cover all the costs on the payer side, on the, uh, on the delivery side. So now we have three giant uh, healthcare payers in the U.S., all more than 100 billion. You see them there. And the thing that I think is a very interesting dynamic around the, the nation, it's about 6,000 hospitals in the U.S. There is a massive consolidation occurring on the provider side. So, you know, 171 hospitals uh, in the last 18 months uh, merged. And there's a theory that uh, 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 several folks are following that uh, and over time the U.S. will get to the point that there'll be just 15 to 20 giant providers who, who will uh, deal with the big employers, the big payers, uh, and the, the large uh, technology companies all at once. So for us, as a, uh, a large hospital system, you know, it's imperative that we be great uh, at every phase of care, so it's not just what occurs in the lab or the OR, uh, and also, every hospital, virtually every university in the U.S., is on the hunt for new revenue from its current base, and that really gets down to two things, philanthropy and then the industrial uh, application of the capabilities of the hospital. So, for us as partners, you know, we like to believe, you know, we have a lot of distinctive capabilities. Uh, uh, we need to be kind of better at leveraging that. Uh, we, uh, you know, coming to Boston from Cleveland, 
you know, it's hard to imagine uh, a, a more uh, a base with more potential than the density of activity that is available in Boston. Uh, you know, while we're known for research, we may not be known as much on the innovation axis. And we, even though we live inside a nonprofit academic entity, we certainly aspire to run our business, uh, run our, our activities as a business. Uh, we have about 83 staff on our team. So, you know, when we think about uh, working with industry, we like to, you know, be clear about what industry values are uh, in our capabilities, and you see them there. And, and increasingly, as the model evolves, and, and you know, again, particularly, uh, more and more uh, large companies, most recently General Electric, uh, locating either their headquarters or significant operations in Boston. Uh, you know, we need to know what they want out of us and we need to know how to be an effective partner. So, revenue is important for us. Uh, I just actually presented to our board uh, of trustees a couple days ago. Our forecast for uh, this year was $121 million, uh, when the fiscal year ends at the end of September. So, you know, in, in a system with $9 billion in revenue, not an overwhelming number, but again, I think an expression of, of trying to drive new value from existing assets. Shifting here, uh, again, remembering that we live within this uh, academic entity, yet the measure of our work is in the commercial sector. So, you know, core to our model is, uh, Folks, leaders who are uh, working full time in the sector. So, our uh, chair was the executive vice president of Genzyme for years, and our, uh, our vice chair of our advisory board uh, was the COO of, of uh, uh, Boston Scientific, and actually is the COO of SV Life Sciences, which was mentioned by one of the earlier speakers. So, representative uh, uh, of some of the best venture funds in the business but also uh, technology categories and uh, kind of stages where you know, we have some folks who have been very successful entrepreneurs themselves. In an active dialogue with us, you know, lots of academic centers have boards, but for us, I probably interact with these folks 15 times a week if you were to count uh, emails and, uh, and uh, uh, phone calls, and, and I think absolutely essential for us in terms of our model. So a core to our model, maybe the core, is the concept of you know, how do we most effectively organize for industry? And you know, uh, I referenced, John referenced the fact that we have these two giant academic uh, hospitals at the core. What we've done is uh, uh, group all of our work into nine clinical uh, verticals, let's call them. So the classic ones, you find them in any hospital. And you have representatives of some of these uh, who will be on the panel in a minute. We have uh, 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 neurology, uh, cardiovascular, cancer. So either organ systems or disease areas, the predominant ones that uh, the industry is organized on, we are the same way. And we've recruited in folks from the top of uh, industry categories to, uh, to lead those. So I, I don't know if this is fully visible, but you look on the far left hand side, the person leading that for us, a guy named Pat Fortune, had been the uh, head of research at Baxter, uh, was a principal in a uh, mid-sized uh, venture fund in Boston, and was also senior in BMS in Monsanto. So if you see this, this gives you a flavor of how we see things. So if you look in the far left, the cancer and pathology market sector, we're doing about $300 million in research. Our commercial revenue last year was about 13 million off of that 300 million. This gives us a guide. Never, there's never a correlation between those two, direct correlation between those two numbers. But you know, our aspirations to grow areas and then strategically address uh, ones that uh, may have uh, underperformed is uh, is important for us. And if you know anyone wants to talk about this model afterwards, love to engage. You know, a lot going on there. But for us, the question is capacity uh, versus return. So John mentioned our fund. Uh, uh, we have, uh, we're in 25 companies, Partners Innovation Fund. We just grew it to 100 million. And uh, the net IRR, based on the five exits you see there, is 26%. Uh, 
and it probably will go up uh, when the lockup ends for Editas, which is uh, the only public one of those companies. Costem, acquired by Novartis, uh, uh, Adheron, acquired by Roche, Innovation, the medicines company, and Cupid by Evercrew. So, so you know, to me, kind of an affirmation of the quality of discovery and the, uh, the, you know, the ability for uh, essentially on-site application of those breakthroughs in a way that can uh, you know, help to drive care. So uh, we're pretty bullish on this. We're actually out raising a companion fund for $50 million. This will be uh, uh, external uh, investors, uh, but be managed as, as a single unit, so $150 million total. Um, we've had over 200 spin-off companies, about 100, more than 100 of those are located in the state of Massachusetts. And now as we approach uh, new uh, models, I mentioned the $150 million, you see it there on the left. But we have a, a new model, uh, uh, heavily driven by investments from Europe, but also from South America and Asia, focused on one center at one of our hospitals, it's that third one, the Wellman Fund. And pretty interesting model. This is a, the, the Center for Photomedicine, uh, Fractional Lasers. Um, uh, maybe some folks are familiar with the technology in the US called Cool Sculpting for uh, cryo-fat ablation. That, uh, all developed at that one center. About $7 billion in product sales in the last 10 years. So working with some outside bankers, we were able to raise a fund that uh, will quickly be $100 million. And the two interesting things to me is, uh, in our approach, we decided to go outside the U.S., and virtually all that investment has come from uh, you know, large players, some, some sovereign wealth funds, other categories. And two, 10% of everything that gets raised in the fund is available for pre-commercial uh, research in the center. So, uh, you know, a recognition among the investors that keeping that uh, engine moving as quickly as possible will be to their uh, economic benefit. Micromedicine, just an example of a deal we've uh, recently accomplished. This is a $35 million investment from uh, Central European investors built around, again, one family of technology, and in this case, uh, at least from our view, a $27 million pre-money valuation, which is, uh, even in Boston, uh, rare. So, just to give you kind of a flavor, you know, snapshot of, for us, uh, things we're up to. Uh, uh, machine learning, artificial intelligence, seems to have reached a new threshold, particularly in healthcare. So we are teaming with, uh, we just announced a $10 million collaboration with NVIDIA, uh, companies across the spectrum uh, that are either selling uh, capabilities or uh, solutions into the uh, diagnostic realm. And uh, we expect to have a $50 million pool of money to drive this application uh, initially focused on radiology. Uh, I don't know if there's any radiologists present, but at least our leadership thinks that in 10 years that business is going to be fundamentally changed. Uh, in terms of the, the mode of diagnosis. Uh, also the diagnostic end, uh, uh, Liquid, uh, we're launching a company on a joint venture basis on, with uh, Liquid Biopsy Technology. Uh, we working with, uh, uh, again in the diagnostic area, working with uh, a couple of giant companies on new, uh, new ways to diagnose uh, uh, and uh, collaborating with folks on the outside. And then just today, uh, one of our lead uh, neuroinflammation researchers uh, was uh, made worldwide news it's on the front page of the International New York Times, uh, uh, Dr. Rudy Tanzi, for uh, showing the potential link uh, between uh, uh, infection and Alzheimer's. It's a pretty exciting uh, breakthrough. So again, just keeping the, the snapshot going, uh, we're working on some new models to uh, increase how we collaborate with industry, placing early career uh, faculty of ours into industry in a very efficient, uh, straightforward way, and at times hosting more industry on our end. And you're really exploiting the, the knowledge base in the Harvard uh, family. Uh, we have a competition going on right now, internal, where we'll award 10 
the dollar uh, 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 support grants to our people to do translational work to uh, speed commercialization of, of their uh, discoveries. Now switching over, and I think most of the people here have an interest in health information technology. Uh, you know, I think the interesting thing if you're in the provider world, you are both a customer and developer of technology, so I'm trying to give you a little flavor of both. I get, this slide is actually from uh, our friends at IBM, but just uh, to, to, from my standpoint, you know, uh, referencing the magnitude of the health IT opportunity, this is just in the U.S., uh, you know, so much of transformation that the answer to the challenge is in more efficient systems uh, and, and the design of those new information approaches. So, uh, you know, some folks would argue that uh, close to a trillion dollars is available as, uh, you know, in terms of potential market penetration when you look at uh, avoidable uh, expenditures in the current system. Of course, the federal government is uh, driving this in so many different ways, whether it's uh, trying to ensure the ubiquity of electronic health records throughout uh, the U.S. or other modes. So, bringing it down to our environment, uh, you know, we see, you know, again, referenced, I think, by a lot of the speakers here, um, um, IT investment is uh, by far, on a, on a uh, growth basis, the largest in healthcare. Uh, in our view, you think about the last 15 years or so, the, you know, getting the infrastructure in place, uh, having the ability to acquire the data, uh, characterize, uh, let's, let's say, the last decade. Now, uh, data are being aggregated, and I think the, the challenge going forward is integrating that into the workflow, and I'm sure the other speakers will talk to this, but uh, still elusive in some ways. I would, you know, when you talk about game conditions, getting uh, effective decision support tools uh, at the point of care uh, is, uh, uh, you know, is happening, but uh, lots to do in the future. For us, we have a lot of uh, long-standing capabilities. The Laboratory of Computer Sciences at Mass General, 50 years old, uh, uh, drove the industry in many ways. MUMPS was developed at MGH. Our Center for Connected Health, I'll say a word about it in a minute. In, in our view, we have about 70 discrete HIT applications that we're developing on the inside. And then, of course, there's the torrent of solutions coming towards us as a giant provider, and, and you know, sorting and selecting among those is a, is a big challenge for every hospital system. One ex example of a recent deal for us last year, working with uh, a company called Health Catalyst, originally an electronic data warehousing company from uh, Salt Lake City, uh, we collaborated with them uh, to have them assist our population health management team in developing new technologies that our, our internal group will use, and then Health Catalyst will bring it to market uh, around the U.S. So, uh, this uh, this is another IBM slide. The, the thing I love the most about this, and maybe some of you have seen it before, is a single individual, so each of us, uh, is expected over the lifetime of our health uh, journey to generate more than a thousand terabytes of data. And it's just stunning. I, it's stunning to think of what it was, what you would say that number was five years ago, and what it might grow to, uh, particularly as we talk about new capabilities on the imaging and pathology side. So, you know, just trying to imagine how the healthcare system is being redefined by these new electronic tools. So some of the things uh, that we're doing, I mentioned our Center for uh, 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 Connected Health uh, Center, uh, started more than a decade ago, led by a dermatologist, Dr. Joe Kaviter. Uh, I think they've done a lot to establish the industry and to support uh, others as they develop uh, new uh, tools. Um, and uh, you can see, you know, give you a little snapshot of some of the things we're doing there. And, you know, virtual video, you know, talked about it for a long time, it is happening. These are some of the environments it's happening for uh, us. Uh, these are at Mass General, but also Brigham and Women's. You see other, I, you know, more uh, specific clinical examples of how these e-visits are working. And this is the growth of them at just one of our hospitals at Mass General. So it gives you a sense for, uh, 
you, you know, I, I guess my view, personal view, is it's not that, you know, uh, that some of this technology was pioneered long ago by NASA, you know, we have astronauts, and we're, you know, have no other way to get health care to them. That's not what it's about. This is about people that are three miles away from the hospital who can be in a continuous cycle of care and not come into the, you know, the, the uh, waiting area and, you know, just take advantage of uh, the, uh, the being part of an electronically defined community. So, one example of a virtual visit technology we are working to bring to market is an asynchronous uh, 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 virtual visit technology you see it described here. This was developed by one of our primary care physicians. And by asynchronous virtual visit, what this means is the patient can actually get uh, healthcare guidance of value in their own interaction with the electronic system. Eventually, it becomes two-way with the provider, but initially, it allows uh, quality information to be uh, 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 imparted to the patient in a setting that does not uh, require any additional uh, uh, human uh, manpower. So if anyone's interested in this, this is real time. We are looking for outside uh, collaborators on this. Uh, you know, obviously another area of uh, uh, you know, metabolic disease across the spectrum, whether it's obesity or diabetes, uh, one of the largest areas of spend in all of healthcare. We are doing quite a bit with, and you can see different programs at our different hospitals, not just our two big ones. Well, medication adherence, uh, 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 obviously uh, an area, a char rather charged area in U.S. healthcare these days and uh, in other nations as well in terms of the you know, pricing and curative technology, so adherence, very important from our uh, standpoint. Um, you know, readmission is a huge issue in the U.S., uh, and the, the requirement to drive it down is uh, significant. So just uh, using some of these technologies, if you can see those slides, you can see uh, the rather significant uh, change in readmission patterns uh, in one of our pilot programs. So again, a big, a big uh, initiative for us. And then I, I can't come all this way and not mention our own World Medical Innovation Forum that we just held in Boston uh, a couple weeks ago. In our model, we focus on one uh, clinical area. This year it was cancer. Uh, we had over a thousand registrants you see there. Uh, uh, these are an interesting thing for us. We uh, have profiled a lot of our early career faculty in this model, so we had almost 25 uh, junior faculty talking about their work uh, in 10-minute uh, segments. And then uh, uh, our senior faculty coupled with industry CEOs uh, and investors and entrepreneurs talking to some of the key areas in all of cancer. And then uh, some top CEOs with the BMS, Amgen, uh, um, uh, Novartis uh, participated in Kathy Giusti there. Uh, you're one of the real agents of change in American healthcare if you haven't encountered her story. Uh, a pharmaceutical executive, I think an H Harvard Business School graduate. Um, she was diagnosed with multiple myeloma, I think 15 or more years ago, uh, and uh, made it her life's quest to improve the system, to drive therapy, and to help other patients. And so this is Kathy was one of our principal speakers with uh, Dr. Nancy Snyderman and network correspondent. And then uh, a fun thing we do every year is interview 50 of our top faculty, what they think will be the breakthrough technologies in the next decade in their field, and you see the 12 there for cancer. You know, some of that pretty pretty obvious, but others I think uh, the, the uh, what they were contemplating behind it uh, are very interesting. So next up for us, uh, we'll be in London uh, next March 25th to 26th for a tailored meeting on uh, kind of state-of-the-art neurosciences. Our uh, collabor principal collaborator on that is the Francis Crick Institute. Uh, love folks to attend, and then our uh, our own World Forum will be in Boston May 1st to the 3rd. So thank you so much. Uh, I don't, John, did you want to do questions or? Yeah, let's take. Uh, we're going to spend the next hour on a. Uh, deeper dive into this topic here, but let's take one or two questions. Yeah. So, um, a while ago we hosted the chairman of a very prominent uh, European farm company. 
sorry. Uh, a while ago, we hosted uh, the chairman of a very prominent European pharma company in Toronto. And halfway through the conversation, he started rushing things. And I said, what's the rush? He says, I have to catch a flight to Boston. And I asked him, why do you fly to Boston? And he paused. And then he says, because they all do. What's so special about Boston? Well, Rafi, thank you for that question, particularly someone who was such a leader in Israel and is now bringing his special gifts to Canada. Uh, you know, if, uh, some of us have been on deck for a few decades. It, uh, and, 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 and I, uh, I actually wrote a reference book in the 90s that you can get on from Amazon for 50 cents uh, on this topic. I don't think there's ever been a place like Boston at this moment, and there's no guarantee it will be that way in the future. I, I, I think virtually all of the 25 largest pharma uh, entities are either, you know, either have a substantial presence or at least something to try to exploit it. Uh, you've got significant device companies. Uh, you know, we've got one of the two uh, poles of the healthcare venture industry uh, located in Boston. And you have companies like GE that are anxious to get there. So the density is unrivaled, and I think, you know, you have to remind yourself, uh, to use a baseball metaphor, that you, uh, uh, you know, we're on third base, uh, we're taking advantage of other people's hard work. Okay. Um, why don't we assemble the next panel, which we're going to do a deeper dive. I think really wanting to see. Wait, sir. I'll continue to read. Sure, yeah, yeah, yeah.